Well, hello, everybody. Good to see you. Well, I can't see you. You can see me, but welcome to uh, this little workshop. We talk about church and leadership and momentum and kind of fueling a movement. And I always think when you fuel a movement, it, it, it has to begin with you as an individual, with you as a leader. Uh, and as you lead your churches and as you lead your organizations, uh, just some reminders as we start and, and give you some practical things. But for us to get in the mindset that, that God's called us, not just for the people that sit in our seats, He's called us to the world that desperately needs to hear him and see him. William Temple, Temple said that the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. Think about that. How does that statement resonate with you? The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. In October 2006, uh, a man by the name of Brad Garlinghouse he was a senior executive and former online giant at Yahoo. He made some headlines because of a memo that he wrote to his fellow executives that was leaked. And it was entitled, the, the Peanut Butter Manifesto. And this letter was a blistering critique of the direction that, that Garlinghouse saw Yahoo was taking. The strategy that the company was taking, oh, he didn't think was very good. And he said it could be described as spreading peanut butter across the myriad opportunities that continue to evolve in the online world. The result is a thin layer of investment spread across everything we do, and thus we focus on nothing in particular. He then added, I hate peanut butter. We all should. <laughs> he was reflecting a common problem that faces many organizations when organizations lose sight of their mission. And they become about too much, and they don't do anything well. It's clear that Yahoo never learned the lesson that Garlinghouse was trying to teach at Yahoo, which at its peak was worth about $125 billion, was sold in 2016 to Verizon for just a mere $5 billion. But think about that. Yahoo's eventual demise in Garlinghouse's words should serve as a wake-up call, I think, to the church. We've talked about it. Church is to be a place where many things happen when it comes together, but there is one and only one overarching focus. And that was Jesus' last words, to go and make disciples of all nations. As Jesus said, that's the mission of the church, is to outreach, to go outside of ourselves and bring lost people into relationship with Jesus Christ. Or as William Temple put it, the church is the only place that exists for the benefit of of those who are not yet members. As we go along, there's a story of Lewis and Clark who were going across an expedition to explore the newly acquired Louisiana Purchase, which was built on their expedition on a false expectation. See, they believed, like everybody who had gone before them, that the unexplored West was exactly the same geography as the familiar East. So what they did when they discovered that, they and everyone else before them had been wrong. So what did they do when all they had to climb a mountain was an old wooden canoe? <laughs> what did they do when they realized it was no longer just about finding the Northwest Passage or a water route? It was now going to be their exploration into a whole new world, one that was uncharted, untraveled, and one that they were just not prepared for. I was reading about an article that was written recently that said sociologists and theologians refer to this recently passed period as Christendom, the 1,700-year-long era with Christianity as the privileged center of Western culture life. Christendom gave us blue laws and the Ten Commandments in school. It gave us under God in the Pledge of Allegiance and exhortations to Bible reading in the national newspapers. It said that in 1963, where I live, that the Los Angeles Times had stories on the Warren Commission, the 9,000-member Hollywood Presbyterian Church, and it had a list of daily Bible readings for the upcoming week. Can you imagine today in the Los Angeles Times or any of your papers or pulling up Yahoo on our browser that it would exhort us to read the Bible and give us a passage for the day? Most of those days are gone, the author said, where Sunday mornings are more about soccer and Starbucks than about the Sabbath. 
when Christian student groups are getting de-recognized on university campus, when the fastest growing faith affiliation among young adults is none, a number of pastors, maybe including you, are ready to throw in the towel, not knowing if they can or if they even want to jump into the new realities that are before us. And COVID just added a whole other layer of complexity. Reportedly, upwards of 1,500 pastors, they leave the ministry every month. 1,500. Think about that. The landscape has changed. Culture has changed. The perception of church has changed. The job of being a pastor has changed. And the question still remains for us as pastors and leaders in 2020. Are we willing to teach and preach the never-changing gospel of Jesus Christ in new and fresh ways? that bring about life change in the lives of our people. As we go after the Great Commission and try and figure out what it means to live out the Great Commandment, are we willing to have different conversations about how to lead, how to advance the kingdom of God and the mission of the church in our ever-changing world? The real question for you and for me is, are we even willing to consider changing to meet the changing demands of our community and our congregation? See, I think if you can imagine with me what Lewis and Clark thought when they came to the Rocky Mountains, what it was like for them when they got to the base of those massive mountains and they discovered that their canoes were not going to get them over these enormous hills that stood in their way. When now the irrefutable reality was there was no water route to this Pacific Ocean. History was defined in that moment and all they could have done Because they could have decided it was a myth and said there was no way forward. They could have turned back and returned to Washington and told Thomas Jefferson to send another crew, equipped to travel the unknown and the uncharted mountains. But Lewis, in that moment, didn't do that. He actually decided to lead. And he actually decided to step in the unknown and the uncharted and unsure future that would define Lewis and Clark and change our world. Todd Bolsinger, in his book, which I can't recommend enough, Canoeing the Mountains, gave some definitions on leadership, and I agree with his assessment. First of all, leadership is not authority. It's not a title or position that a person holds. Leadership is not management. Management actually just cares for what is. Leadership is focused on what can be or must be. Leadership is about an organization fulfilling its mission and realize its reason for being. Leadership is actually a way of being, being. It is about mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges and thrive. You see, therefore, leadership is always about personal and corporate transformation. Because, but because we are hardwired to resist change, every living system requires someone in it to live into and lead that transformation necessary to take us into the future we are resisting. And if someone is not functioning as a leader, the system will always default to the status quo. But you see, leadership is about an organization fulfilling its mission and realizing its reason for being. In the very beginning of Scripture, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth. Genesis 1.26 See, God is the leader of all men and women, and he calls all of his children, every believer, to lead others. And isn't it amazing that we get included, and we have a huge part in people coming into a life-transforming relationship with the creator of the world. He chooses, and his creation for us is to help others become a new creation in Jesus Christ. We have an active responsibility to be his voice to proclaim his love to our world. And Scripture gives us a a consistent pattern of those called into leadership by God. And when God decided to call a nation into His own, He didn't call the masses. He called a person. He raised up Abraham to be the one to lead them and to guide them. He sacrificed. He struggled. He questioned. But he believed God called him and he stepped forth and he led. When he wanted his people to be freed from slavery and led to the promised land, he didn't choose a committee. He raised up a servant named Moses. When it came... 
they actually, when it came to them actually possessing the promised land, he raised Joshua and told Moses, thank you, but it's time for someone else to lead. I am calling you and I will never leave you nor forsake you, Joshua. Moses had his time and he took us to this place. Now it's someone else. I want you to be strong and courageous for I am with you. See, every time God wanted to do something extraordinary, he called ordinary men and women to step up and to lead. And in Matthew 20, 20, there's a story that begins with the mother of Zebedee's son. And came to Jesus and she said, hey, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left. And may they sit in your kingdom. And Jesus just said, you really don't know what you're asking. And after a few words, he concluded this story with these words. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. My prayer in 2020 is that we would all look for ways to serve one another and help each other move the kingdom of God forward. And I believe we can and we'll go further faster as we look to partner. As we look to serve and pray for one another. As we fuel a spirit-led movement especially here in the West where we say where Jesus changes people who change the world. We are better together. But let me tell you, God's calling you to lead, not to be the solo person. But there's always a leader that steps up. There's always a one that voice matters. And people are looking for a man or a woman to step in, I believe, and step up. It's kind of the story of my life. Uh, I'm at Friends Church. Our church is 107 years old. And there's a man by the the name of Danny Roach. Uh, Danny Roach was here with me. Uh, He was the minister of music. I was a 22-year-old kid. And I walked into a room, and they interviewed me for a part-time music position back in 1992. And in 1992... um, I wanted that job. I was a trumpet player. I was playing trumpet at Disneyland. Think about that. I was a full-time trumpet player, and then I was a part-time choir director. And I got both of those jobs on the very same day. They had interviewed about 16 or 17 people for this choir position. I was the youngest by far at the age of 22. Danny was probably in his late 60s at the time. And he told the group of elders and leaders, this is the kid we need to hire. Because we need to step into the future. We need to give this kid a chance. And I know he's not experienced. And I know he's young. And I know he's just a trumpet player. But I think he's the guy. And now, almost 30 years later, I'm the senior pastor. See, Danny Roach's voice mattered. It mattered that he spoke up and he led. He stepped into the unknown. He took a chance on a a 22-year-old kid. I'm a pastor, I get to lead a denomination, I've been in a place to see God move, and God uses ordinary people. Think about it, I was just a kid wearing stupid outfits and dancing around Disney, and now I get to be a part of changing the world for Jesus Christ and leading others to Jesus. And part of my job is to help you see clearly where you and I can make an impact as we serve each other, as we come alongside of each other, as we move forward the kingdom of God together. And I want to invite you into the story of the next hundred years, not the past hundred years, but the next hundred years. See, leaders, you are setting the table for the next hundred years. And one thing I know is I can't do anything about the past. It's gone. But I have been called to help shape the future and bring clarity to where we are going. And so have you. So I want to help you be ready to do that. I want to help you to be ready to lead your church, your congregation, your people, your region to the next place God has it. And the book of Habakkuk gives us some tools to lead our people into the uncharted, unknown future that stands in front of us. Here's what it says. It says, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that we may run to who, and who reads it may run to it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end of it, it will speak. 
and it will not lie. I love this. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. See, Habakkuk did a few things as he shared this word from the Lord. He had to see so others could see clearly. I want you to just think about that for a minute. He had to see so others could see clearly. He had to go where others had never gone before. He had to spend time with Jesus. Remember back in our very first session, it talked about ordinary men. It said these men were ordinary, but they spent time with Jesus. You want to see where others can't see and you want to take them where others have never gone? I think you need to spend time with Jesus because then the Spirit begins to speak to you and make things clear that He hasn't made for others. And you invite others in to see that picture and you invite others in to paint a picture of a future that's brighter than the past. Second thing, He had to make it known so others could not only know the vision but could hold Him accountable for the vision. He had to make it plain so everyone would understand it. Let me tell you something. Vision's not complicated. You hear from God, and you explain it in ways that your congregation can understand. Keep it simple. But when you have a compelling vision, people get behind it. Fueling a spirit-led movement. People understand that. Where Jesus changes people who change the world. That's our mission. That's our big overall arching vision of where we want to go. Now, we are figuring out how are we going to do that. We're going to plant churches we're going to send missionaries. We're going to change our community and care for the poor and bring justice. But it's all going towards fueling something. And we believe it's a spirit-led movement. He had to make it permanent so it would live beyond his life and endure the test of time. I love that. What are you doing right now that's enduring the test of time? See, anything that you do is kind of meaningless, as we talked about, unless Jesus shows up. We want to fuel a spirit-led movement because that's the only thing that's going to stand the test of time. Habakkuk said, hey, make it permanent. It's got to last the rest of time. What are you dreaming that's so big that unless God shows up, it isn't going to happen? Habakkuk says, that's what I'm calling you to. He had to be patient because it wasn't just for now and for him, but it was for future generations that were still to come. Think about that. God says, I want to do a work in and through the church. So now we give him glory and honor because in Ephesians he says, I'm building my church and I want to do it not just now, but for what? For future generations. He had to live by faith because it was given by the provider and giver of his faith. And his call was to be faithful to the call God put on his life. See, listen, you have to see, leaders, what others can't see. And help them go where they don't even know they need to go. I was thinking about this the other day. As I've sat in this church and been here for a long time, there are so many things that, as a leader, I have done that everybody hasn't agreed with. So many things that we've been called to do that, as you know, uh, everybody wasn't on board. So many things that we've done that people have left our church. So many bad emails I've gotten. So many things that people told me I was crazy. And I just kept saying, am I hearing from God? Am I going to listen to him or am I going to listen to the people? And you will always have people no matter what you do. Not like you. Not go with you. Not be with you. That's part of being a leader. But I've just decided, which side am I going to be on? The one that listens to God or the one that listens to the people? Because if I don't listen to God, <laughs> I'm going to have um, God going, I called you to this and you didn't do what I called you to do. If I, don't, if I listen to the people, then I'm going to sit and I'm never going to do what God called me to do. I have to decide what side I'm going to go on. And I know on both sides there's somebody not going to be happy with me. But Helen Keller says the, one, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight, but no vision. The only thing worse than being blind is having sight, but no vision. At 19 months old, Helen Keller contracted an unknown illness described by doctors as an acute congestion of the stomach and the brain, which might have been scarlet fever or meningitis in her day. Uh, the illness left her both deaf and blind. 
You see, she lived, as she recalled in her autobiography, at sea in a dense fog. This statement has often struck me in a profound way. As Helen had not seen a thing in this world, yet saw so clearly the world that she lived in. A world where those who had sight to see, yet had no vision to change the world for the better. These people were the ones that were actually blind to all they could be, or all that they were called to be. And as she stated, that was worse than being blind. (laughs) Sometimes that's what it's like for us as pastors and leaders, but even more so for those that sit in our seats and listen to us week in and week out. You see, I think those people are are longing to be led, led to the source of life, led to the one who has given us life and to the only one who can bring heaven to this earth. I, I still find it amazing that God calls us to proclaim his world, his word, his vision, and his heart to the people who have eyes to see. But many times we're blind to who God is wanting them to be. Lewis and Clark came to this point on their journey. When they looked up, and they were probably just overwhelmed at those mountains. Those mountains that stood in front of them, they would have been overwhelming to me. When the tools they had been given and the resources that they thought would be useful, such as a canoe, when those things weren't going to work anymore, When all they knew about their expedition had changed, they either had to adapt and change or miss out on one of the greatest discoveries and adventures known to man. They had to reframe the conversation they were having from all they had known and done to what do we do next and what can we learn and what new strategy do we need to accomplish the goals we have to reach our destination. And see, nothing is different for the church of Jesus Christ. I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about um, a couple seasons in my life, and then I want to talk about the season we're in right now in COVID. But uh, being at the church for 29 or 30 years, there's lots of things that happen to you. Some things I wish I could go back and and redo. Uh, Some things that I said, God, what in the world are you up to? Um, 2003, I was the music pastor here. Uh, and I remember going into the then senior pastor's office, and I remember at, at that time, um, it was the day, a couple days before Easter, and he said, hey, can you come over to my house on, on Monday? I want to talk to you. And we had had some conversations and, and some ways we were looking at church that were a little bit different, but um, that day after Easter in 2003, I was let go from my position. And as I was let go from my position um, earlier in that year, that was in April, January, my mother had passed away from breast cancer that had gone to her brain. The next day after I was fired, um, my father-in-law was hit by a car crossing the road, walking to his car, and went into a coma and never came out. My wife was pregnant with our third child. So 2003, I remember uh, my family lived in Australia, my wife's family, and that's where we went to do the funeral. And I remember flying out and saying, I can't wait for 2003 to be over. And Madi, my wife, just said, we're going to be okay. God's got this. And both her parents had died, and I had lost my job, and she was going through the emotion of being pregnant, and we had just done two funerals within a span of four months, and she said, everything's going to be okay. And I couldn't see anything that was in front of me, but I just had to decide, is this the God I'm going to trust and the God I'm going to serve? And my identity was actually wrapped up in my job, and God stripped a lot of that away from me. He stripped a lot of it away from me, and then he called me back to be the senior pastor at the church that had let me go. And the other pastor had taken 1,200, 1,400 people to another church and went down the street, and our church split. And where I sit right now was um, just a shell. And we were $14 million short on this building. And I had to let go of like 32 people on our staff. And it's an envious position, I know, for all of you. But I, I walked back into this place not because I wanted to. This is the last place I wanted to go. But it was where God called me to. And he actually called me to step up and lead in a time of crisis. Little did I know, six or seven months later, I'd walk through, six or seven years later, excuse me, I'd walk through a depression. I'd have a betrayal on our staff when I was away on a, on a sabbatical. Little did I know that in my darkest days, God would be reshaping and reforming our church to do what we did in India and what we do today. See, we sit in this season of unknown. And I think that's just part of the Christian faith and Christian leadership. 
COVID is among us. I don't know what it means. We don't know here in California when we can even get back together. We have a room that seats 2,800 people or so, and we can't have 100. We have to have 100 or less people in the room still, and we don't think that's changing. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but I just want to let you know, I've been here before. I've walked through things before, and I've seen God show up each and every time. See, resilient leadership will be redefined and refined in a crisis. And if you really want to see innovation and change happen around you, someone said find a crisis. And it is in the middle of a crisis that we come to the realization that at an end is near or a new future is being born. On the verge of a crisis, we are also on the verge of our greatest moment. And it's at that moment that we must decide, are we going to change? Are we going to innovate? Are we going to be different? Or are we going to die and give up? I have said that crisis brings about six things. And I believe as I've walked through crisis in leadership, these six things have come true. First is this, crisis brings clarity. It brings clarity in who you are and clarity in what you're doing. I can tell you, I was not equipped. I was just an ordinary person. I was a member, a trumpet player, who got asked to be a senior pastor. But it brought clarity to me that God was calling me. I didn't want this job. He gave me this job. It'll bring clarity in your life right now. Some of you need clarity. And this crisis is an opportunity for you to get it. It's an opportunity for you to reset your mission, to reset your goals, to take your church somewhere new that it's never been. This is the perfect opportunity for you to do that. Second thing, crisis brings confirmation. Are you in the place God's called you to be? Are you excited? Are you energized? Are you passionate? Or is God calling you somewhere else? It brings confirmation when you look around and things begin to happen in the midst of crisis that you could have never explained or never expected. Crisis number three brings creativity. I love our team. I love what our team's doing. I love the things that are before us. We're going into a new season. We're changing really kind of where we're headed in the next season because of COVID and what it has birthed. We're not going to stay the same and we won't be the same when we come back. How about you? Fourth thing, crisis brings out curiosity. I think people are searching right now more than ever. Our online numbers have exploded. And we started looking at people were tuning in. People were wanting to know. People are curious. Fifth thing is crisis brings out collaboration. Greatest time for you and your people to have conversations about what's next. Dream big. Think big. Think different. Because collaboration, being together, you're better. And it brings it out. And then the last one is crisis brings out the crazies. If you haven't met them yet, they're coming. If you haven't been told you're crazy for not opening and you're not following God, if you've been told you need to never open again, all of it starts coming out. People start writing you emails. Then the justice thing comes up. And good grief, we have been thrown into a season of crazy. And the crazies come out. But you are called to lead through that and represent Christ well in that. I just want to tell you, your resiliency is being built right now. But don't let this season define you, but let it redefine you for the future God wants in you and through you. So let me ask you a couple questions. What do you love about this season? What is God doing in you right now that you just love? I love, honestly, I do love having 18 weekends off, I have to admit. I've never had that many weekends off in a row. We record on Wednesday or Thursdays. It's been great. But I love the creativity that's come. I love the collaboration that's come. I love the ideas that have come forth. I love that our church has stepped into our community in different ways, and we would have never done it without COVID. What excites you right now? Start writing them down. What has you worried? What about your church? What do your your church people need? What do your leaders need greater clarity on? Is there confusion about where you're going and what you're doing? Are you just existing instead of thriving in this season? I promise you right now in this crisis is a great time to prepare for the future. Because when your people come back, it's not going to be the same. And honestly, church shouldn't be. God's given us an amazing window to look through to see a future that is waiting for us. And I want to be a pastor that fuels this moment and gains the momentum in the midst of a crisis for his glory and his honor. 
You see, this is, a, is an ordinary key. And at our general conference, I pass them out to everyone in attendance. It is a key that for us has, has three purposes. It's to unlock doors that have yet to be opened. I told them that there was a brand new car out in the parking lot, and one of them had the key, and that wasn't true. So we just laughed about that. But it does have potential. And this key represents three things for you. It's the key to unlock your leadership potential. It's just ordinary. Every key is different that I gave out. Every key had something unique about it. Every key had unique markings and indentations. It was created differently, and that's you. But there is leadership potential that God wants to unlock in you in this season. This is the key, secondly, to unlock the power of doing something greater together. I don't know, as Eastern Region, you have an opportunity together to be a mighty force for God and His kingdom. As individual churches, you can do only so much, but together, united, you can do so much more. And this key is a key of collaboration and a key of community. But that's up to you. Are you willing to follow Tom and the leadership of the Eastern Region to do what only God can do and do more than you could ever imagine? And the third, I said this key was to unleash the next generation of leaders. See, um, one of the keys to being at a place 30 years is I do my best in leadership to try and say what is best for the church, not what is best for Matthew. Here's what I know is best for the church. The church is way better when I teach twice a month instead of four times a month. I am a much better preacher twice a month than I am four times a month, and so are you if you would admit it. You might not have the privilege to have a teaching pastor, but I bet there's somebody you could raise up. I bet there's somebody you could give an opportunity to. We just decided that we're going to be developers of the next generation, and we are deliberately going to develop the next generation of leaders. We, we see this as a key to this church living way beyond any person, because it's not about me, and it's not about you. 106 years later, we're still here as a church, and our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. But see, leadership is a way of being. It's about mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges and thrive. It's about giving people opportunity to lead before they're ready. And therefore, leadership is always about personal and corporate transformation. Because people, um, you know this, we're hardwired to resist change. And every living system requires someone in it to live into and lead into the transformation necessary to take us into the future that people are resisting. If someone is not functioning as a leader, the system will always default to the status quo. But leadership is about an organization fulfilling its mission and realizing its reason for being. So as I stated, Fringe Church is 106 years old. Our best days are still ahead of us. Why? <laughs> because we're unleashing our potential as leaders. We are investing in the next generation of leaders. And we are doing it in a collaborative spirit together. Our unique gift that God has given myself and the other leaders here in you is a gift that has the potential to fuel a spirit-led movement. Where Jesus begins to change people, that's us, who then go forth and change the world. But the key in your organization is you. And you have the ability and the opportunity and the chance to lead in this season like no other. I pray you take that challenge. I pray you open up the doors that God is waiting to open up for you. And I pray in this crisis it brings some clarity. And it brings some conviction. And it brings some change to your organization for the future. I pray you're focused on that future and not on the past. Because God, I believe, wants to do something in you and through you for the future of his church. And I'm grateful to have this time to share with you. Let me pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your movement in us and through us. Thank you for your calling. I just want to pray again over these pastors and leaders that, God, you would fill them with your spirit. That in this season of this COVID crisis and all that's been going on, God, that you would just right now um, realign them to your mission, 
that God, you would reignite a passion in them, that you would begin to unlock some of those uh, potential keys that, that God can help them move into a future that I think is really bright. And so today, God, uh, may we be people that fuel others to move towards you and have a relationship with you. And may God, you be honored in all things. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen.